And I invite any children who, are, who would like to join me to come forward. <laughs> Hi. Uh, hey, bud. How's it going? Come have a seat. Yeah, we're just on the floor. So, I want to talk for just a quick minute about peace. Do any of you little ones know what the word peace is, means? Do you know? You don't know? Do you know? Do you know what? Probably hear it from your mommy and daddy sometimes about how they want peace and quiet. It means calm. This one probably applies with you two, no fighting. But it means more than that. It also means everybody having everything they need to be happy and healthy and whole. That's why when we come together here, we always say, peace be with you during our service because we want everybody here to be happy and healthy and whole. And that certainly includes no fighting, but it also means everything else. And we say it to each other not only because we want it for ourselves, because we want it for the whole world. And if the world's going to have peace and know what it means to be happy, it's going to depend on you and you and you and all the rest of us. We're the ones who bring peace to the world. Jesus designed it that way. And that's pretty good news, I think. Let's go get some stamps. That whole process was more peaceful than I expected. <clears throat> Alleluia, Christ is risen. Lord is risen indeed. How tempting it is to talk this morning about our friend Thomas. I venture that many of us here would have trouble counting the number of sermons we've heard over the years about doubting Thomas about how we are among those who believe without seeing, or about how Jesus does indeed give Thomas what he needs in order to believe. And all of those sermons are well and good, but I'm starting to think that if we skip ahead and talk again about Thomas today, that we might miss some of the most important material in our gospel lesson. According to John, when Jesus first appears among his disciples after the resurrection, he says, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I sent you. Receive the Holy Spirit. If you, receive, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. These words from Jesus are at the heart of John's telling of the resurrection. And therefore, if we want to understand anything John has to say about the resurrection, then we need to understand these words that Jesus speaks. Jesus starts by saying, peace be with you. 
Those are the same words that I say every time I preside at the Eucharist. Words that I will be saying to you in just a few moments. But if we hear that word peace as meaning simply an absence of violence, then we're missing the point. Although John wrote his gospel in Greek, I'm sure that when Jesus appeared among those disciples after the resurrection, he spoke to them in their own language, in Aramaic, possibly if he was feeling particularly formal in Hebrew. And so the word he said to them in either language is shalom. Shalom means so much more than just an absence of violence. Shalom means the presence of everything necessary to a good life. Shalom means a fullness of life, an abounding joy, a true safety and wholeness in body, but also in mind and spirit. Shalom means a quiet confidence in the face of adversity, a rootedness that cannot be shaken by trials, a face that, a faith that, as Julian of Norwich puts it, all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. All of that is what Jesus means when he says, peace be with you. And all of that is what we mean when we say it every week. Back in 1955, when he was organizing the bus boycotts in Montgomery, Alabama, Martin Luther King Jr. was criticized for disturbing the peace, a criticism that came to him from many corners, including from other pastors, including many of the Episcopal clergy found in Montgomery. In response to them, he said, True peace is not merely the absence of tension. It is the presence of justice. That, too, is a part of shalom, a wish that all might live within God's justice, within the kingdom of God's goodness, within the righteousness of a restored creation, within the reign of the Lamb who was slain for us and now sits at God's right hand. And it, too, is what Jesus means when he says, peace be with you. And it's what we may mean when we say it as well. For those of us who live on this side of the resurrection, the blessing that is promised to us and the blessing that we must desire for the whole world is Christ's promise of peace. Therefore, it's no wonder that the next words Jesus speaks are, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. Jesus comes into our lives and preaches peace, preaches shalom to us. And then we are sent to preach that same peace to others. We are sent to do the work of building God's reign of justice, to do the work of feeding those who are hungry and loving those who feel abandoned and bringing freedom into the darkness of captivity. God needs us to help in this work. It's God's promise that all of God's children shall indeed know peace. It's our task to be the ones that God works through to bring that peace to fulfillment. And that's why Jesus breathes on the disciples and says, receive the Holy Spirit. Just as the Spirit of God breathed on the waters in the beginning of creation, just as God breathed life into the humans and other creatures that God fashioned out of the dust in creation, just as God breathed life into those dry bones while giving hope through the prophet Ezekiel, 
just as God breathed new life into Jesus and raised him up out of the tomb. So now Jesus breathes on us, gives us new life, and promises us the strength of God to live that life. Jesus not only calls us to do his work, but he gives us the power that we will need to do it. Jesus took our humanity on himself when he was born in a human being. In carrying the cross, in dying and being raised to new life, he transformed that humanity into something new. And in breathing on us and giving us the gift of the Holy Spirit, he shares with us his own divinity. We are no longer merely human. We are also now divine beings. Jesus shares in our humanity. We share in his divinity. Like him, we will need to face suffering and the grave. But because of him, suffering and the grave cannot have the last word. We have power to work for God's kingdom without fear of the cost. We have been breathed to new life. We have the gift of God's own Holy Spirit. And so we come to the moment of choice. Jesus says, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now, this has traditionally been interpreted as a further statement of power and authority given by Jesus to his disciples and thus to the whole church. It's a power that many in the church have been willing to hold over the heads of the children of God. Many use it to declare who is in and who is out, and they feel justified that they are doing the work God has given them to do. But I don't think that these words are a declaration of power at all. Rather, I think that they are an invitation, a moment of choice. If you look throughout the gospel stories, you will find that Jesus never retains sin. Jesus always forgives sin. He even forgives sin in cases when he's not asked to do so, such as when he's healing someone. So therefore, to be Christ-like, to be God-like, to be as one sent by Jesus is to be one who forgives and who does so lavishly. To retain sin is to refuse the invitation Jesus gives us to join him in his ministry and work. Have you ever noticed what happens if you for refuse to forgive someone? Who really ends up bound? Is it you? Or is it the person who has wronged you? My own experience is that when I do not forgive, when I choose to retain a debt because I have been wronged, it's me who ends up bound bound by resentment, bound by anger, bound by fear. That other person, the one who wronged me, he or she usually seems to go on happily enough. I retain the sin, and I'm the one who ends up paying the price for that. It's that peace of God, that shalom in me, that's disturbed and not the peace in the one who has wronged me. If we want to be like Jesus, if we want to live into that promise of peace that he gives, 
if we want to live in the power of the Spirit that He breathes into us, then we must forgive. Forgive the sins of all. The resurrection of Christ breaks the bonds of sin and death, and we cannot, even for the best of intentions, replace those bonds if we want to call ourselves Christians. Now, this doesn't mean that we must suffer quietly or that we must let wrongs done to us go without an answer. Remember, we began this morning with a promise of peace, a promise of God's justice. When we are wronged, we must cry out for justice. When we see others being wronged, we must work to bring justice to them. Living in the Spirit means never being satisfied when any of God's children are still suffering, when any of God's children have yet to make it into the reign of peace. But we cannot confuse this quest for justice with a lack of forgiveness. If we want to bring God's justice into power over sin, then we have to refuse to play by sin's rules. One of the great paradoxes that we find in the life of faith is that the way to take away sin's power is to refuse its terms. To overcome sin, you don't bind it. To overcome sin, you set it free. Forgiving sin means that we refuse to remain in the moment of the wrong done and that we instead insist on moving forward into the time of justice restored. If we retain sin, we become bound with it in the moment of darkness. If we forgive sin, we become free to walk into the light of God's kingdom. My brothers and sisters, this morning we are given a promise and we are faced with a choice. We are promised shalom, true peace and justice in the kingdom of God. And we are promised new life and strength in God's Holy Spirit. And then, we are invited to be followers of Christ, invited to choose to take our part in God's saving work, invited to choose to leave sin behind and to walk forward in freedom and in justice and in peace.